This is all theater. This is all just political theater. Political theater. Political theater. Pure political theater. Theater. Political theater. The nefarious, significant, and protracted political, political, political theater for political theater's sake. I yield back. From Washington, this is Political Theater. Roll Call's review of the spectacle of politics on Capitol Hill and across the country. I'm Jason Day. For many film buffs, October is Scary Movie Month, when we go to the vault to watch Last House on the Left or head to the theater to catch Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. It's also election season as the 2024 campaign winds down. So does The Apprentice fit in here? It's a biopic about the relationship between notorious fixer Roy Cohn and a young Donald Trump. It could have easily been called The Sorcerer's Apprentice or The Devil's Apprentice. Uh, We're going to talk about The Apprentice, the movie, uh, with our White House correspondent and editor-at-large, John Bennett. John, welcome back to to political theater. Uh, I know it's it's been uh, just a few short weeks since your last appearance, but I... I wanted to talk about this movie. Uh, this this is in theaters right now, and I'm curious your thoughts about it. You have seen it not once but twice. <laughs> it's a confession, right, for for all involved there. I, I had a source who passed along an early uh, access. Gotcha. So I watched it twice at home. I watched it once, and then I watched it again with my wife, who's also a political journalist. And um, even she said at the end, that was a lot of Trump, but I didn't mind it. She was entertained by it. I think it's infotainment. Info. Ah, good. Uh, so I'm, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious because I, I actually haven't talked to too many people who have seen it. Uh, and, and I, I saw it uh, when I was recently in Arizona visiting uh, family and, and being there for some family stuff. Uh, Arizona is kind of right now, just the middle of so much going on uh, for, uh, for for the election, both at the presidential level, the Senate level, and and some House races too. So that's three levels. Um, and I saw it in a matinee, uh, a noon matinee uh, at the Arrowhead Town Center. So it's almost I almost had the theater to myself. <laughs> it felt like there were a few other people, but it was a sort of a cavernous uh, movie theater. And I had I had been sitting on a screener for a while. I'm glad I saw it on the big screen uh, because I think it plays better there. But you know, this this has been there's been a lot of drama even before this movie was released. It got uh, it, it was it played at the Cannes Film Festival. The former president uh, Donald Trump, who's the Republican nominee, as as we uh, have heard, I've, I've read some stories <laughs> yeah. that you've written about that. Um, <laughs> I might have even edited. Some it's movie. happening still. Right? It's happening yeah. still. <laughs> he uh, threatened to sue mm-hmm. uh, over as he does. over over some of the elements uh, of the of the film, even though he apparently had not seen it at that point yet, but. You know, got to get that lawsuit thing in, which kind of fits also with the the overall uh, theme and, and plots uh, pursued in the movie. Uh, for again, for you know, for those of you who have not seen it and are not Trumpologists or are not familiar with uh, some of the aspects of Trump's biography dating back to the 1970s, he was working in the Trump Organization for his father uh, in the, in the 70s. Uh, Roy Cohn uh, was his lawyer, the Trump Organization's lawyer, but also Trump's uh, sort of personal lawyer. And the relationship there uh, was was one that just fit. Uh, Cohn had had made a name for himself working for uh, the likes of uh, Joseph McCarthy uh, in in the uh, uh, in the nineteen fifties as a sort of a, a, a Anti communist, and he, you know, had had moved to, you know, he'd been in New York for a while there and was sort of a very aggressive attorney uh, for his for his <laughs> clients, to say the least. Uh, and it's set, you know, his that relationship, the, the movie makes the point that this relationship, this relationship was set that so much of Trump's whole approach to life uh, came from Cone, whether it's never admitting defeat, uh, filing lawsuits all the time, uh, always being on the attack, being aggressive. And I, I was curious for, you know, for you, John, how familiar were you with this part of Trump's biography with Cohn? Uh, I was a slightly familiar with it because uh, a few years back, uh, Woolly Mammoth had uh, Mike Daisy, one of their uh, sort of frequent monologists that's that's there. And he had a, uh, a show called The Trump Card in 2016, which it was, you know, his sort of walking people through this, you know, like. Donald Trump, but and also several aspects of Roy Cohn, 
Uh, and then Roy Cohn, the character of Roy Cohn is a big part of Angels in America. They touch mm-hmm. on on some of his his career there. But how familiar were you with with this part of it? Because I know that this is not common knowledge necessarily about Cohn and Trump's relationship. One thing that that struck me is you had always heard that it was his father and Roy Cohn who really shaped the Donald Trump that we know. But the impression I got walking away from the movie was it was almost exclusively uh, Mr. Cohn and that this was a period where Trump was pulling away from his father business wise. And really within the family, there was uh, a lot more family tensions. I knew about his brother, his, his late brother, who unfortunately passed away, had a lot of uh, addiction issues. And, you know, that is that also shaped young Donald's life. Um, but just the, the, the really outsized, massive role that Roy Cohn played, it's kind of surprised me. And also... You know, young Donald was kind of naive, and as, as portrayed by Sebastian Stan, as portrayed yeah, in yes. the movie, yeah, that yeah. that also yeah. struck me. He was a naive, um, not as street smart as you might expect, and you you get the impression that as he's building those street smarts through Roy, he comes to kind of resent his father for not teaching him more of this. And it is, I thought it was fitting that 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 Donald Trump sued to try to stop this movie. Because there's a scene where Cohn tells him, you always file a lawsuit. The first thing you do when you get into a dispute like this is you always file a lawsuit. And we know now, watching Trump for all these years, it slows everything down. Uh, if you counter sue or if you sue first before they do or, you know, all these motions and, you know, that helped in Georgia, for instance, it'll, it, it helped give uh, the prosecution there more time to screw up. And of course they did. And and, and Trump's attorneys have been filing motions down there and it pushed everything off. Uh, so in one sense, it can work. It didn't work here with the movie, of course, uh, because I've seen it twice and you've seen it once. Uh, but that's what struck me. It was really how he was in this time, according to the movie, he's pulling away from his father. And he right. is almost, you know, it's not it's not that long into the movie where um, he's just in Cone's inner circle. He's right. just in his orbit and he's really... He's really pulled away from his father. Of course, he inherited uh, the money he did from his father that he used for his businesses. Uh, but that's really what stood out to me is is it and it was it was it was it was Roy uh, versus Mr. Trump at at Donald's first wedding. Of course, there's that a tense exchange between mentor and father, and um, it was clear at least the depiction in the movie they did not like each other. It, it was palpable. Yes. Yes. The tension. Yes. I, I think that the thing that I, um, I, I strikes me about this movie about, you know, you're describing these scenes and I'm kind of remembering them is just that again, there, there's always a little bit of bending, right. in, in biopics about, you know, the, you know, di- different dialogue that might've happened. I mean, like we obviously weren't there specifically mm-hmm, right. for, yeah. you know, like uh, the interaction between uh, Cone and, and Fred Trump, but the thing that struck me about it is that again, I I wasn't super excited to see this movie. Um, I wasn't. I was. I was. I was <laughs> yeah. not trepidate. Somewhere between skeptical and right. trepidatious. Right. And and that the, is. And I think that you know our our actually our colleague Jim Saxa put it this way uh, last week when I was talking to him about it. He, he said, for for people who who hate Trump, they don't want to spend any more time with him than they absolutely have to. And for people who love Trump, they don't want to see what these Hollywood libs are going to do to, to take down their man. Mm-hmm. And I would add for people like us who cover politics and 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 people like Trump, you know, for a living, we we have to have some distance in our personal and professional lives. So it was this was not an easy sell. And I think that that's <laughs> that's I think that's common. Right. Like Trump yeah. has dominated. It dominates everything. Politics and pop culture in a way mm-hmm. that very few people in history have. And the idea of going and spending, you know, two hours <laughs> with him. It's which, an investment. Which is a long way of saying it's worth it to me. The, mm-hmm. the, I think I think this movie, the the dramatic arc of it, the performances, the story is just really compelling. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's a good like movie. It, 
it's, yeah. it's just got a lot of tension and a lot of it, it's funny. It's really funny <laughs> in some parts of it. <laughs> I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that either. Yeah. I didn't expect that either. Yeah. It it uh, I I like the way it's shot. I like the production approach. Uh, the dialogue with the characters, Jeremy Strong from Succession. Who plays um, Ray Cohn. Yeah. 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 It, it, just a, a great another great performance out of him. He's having, you know, an extended moment here in his career. Uh, the acting is great. The storytelling is great. The dialogue is great. The tension is great. The production is great. I put it on. The music is great. Yeah, the music it's is great. That's right. It's, it's, it's period specific, you know. Right. Yeah. It's a great movie as a motion picture. They did a really, uh, really, really great job. I put it on on a Saturday in the middle of college football. Uh, my sacred time for John, sacred time John, for me. John Bennett's time. You know, and I whatever. turned on my team, uh, had, not having a great year. So I turned it on as a distraction and I was pretty captivated by it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't finish it all that afternoon. Um, but I watched most of it and mm-hmm. there were some other good games on, uh, in my abode and the movie captured my attention. And of course I watched it again, start to finish. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth a watch. It is an investment, mm-hmm. but you know, we're all used to watching these, Netflix series and everything. Right. So you can watch it in shifts. I mean, it's um, two hours. It's, it's like two yeah. hours and two minutes. Um, and I, I mentioned that I had a screener too. I was expecting to watch it on, on this laptop. Uh, uh, <laughs> old faithful here. Uh, I'm so happy that I saw it in the movie theater because one of the things that you mentioned, like the way that it's shot in the set, in the, in the parts of it that are, you know, it's, it's, it's set roughly from about 1974, 75 to mm. the late eighties, you know, 87, 88. Um, and the, the times, uh, in, in the seventies, it's this very like frenetic kind of slightly drugged up. It feels like, you know, vibe and the, and the color palette's very saturated kind of yeah. like the seventies. It's, it feels like you're, you're a great, you know, mm-hmm. like that olive green, like refrigerator <laughs> that everybody had and, and like shag yeah. carpet and, and yeah. everything is, yeah. it's like kind of bleed all these dark colors bleed into one another. And the, his suits, it, Trump's yeah, his, suits are like that. Yeah. His, yeah. his suits, the club that they, mm-hmm. where they meet, where Cone and, and Trump meet. So that, you know, this like sort of social, like rich guy club <laughs> that they belong to. And then as it moves into the eighties, it gets like <laughs> more and more cheesy. You know, it gets brighter. The, the, the shoulder pads come out for the, for ladies, uh, you know, dresses. Oh, yeah. There's a scene in Aspen at when, when he, uh, when Trump, the, you know, Trump's character is, is trying to woo uh, Ivana and where they're wearing those awful fluorescent ski wear, you know, I mean, and that I remember, <laughs> wearing in, oh, no. in the 80s you oh, know no. um and 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 it becomes like things get louder and and there's mm-hmm. actually this point where like you see the the, the like a film stock and I'm, I'm not sure if it's film or digital video or whatever how, exactly how they did it but there you see almost see these lines these striated lines like you're watching something on vhs like a very oh, 80s yeah. feel yeah. Yeah. and that really comes out um and i uh i mean as you know and as most people who are <laughs> any, even somewhat familiar with this podcast, I do watch a lot of movies. I honestly felt at one point that this was starting to feel like Scarface, the Brian De Palma Scarface with Al Pacino, where it was just like the editing was very, it got very jarring and jerky and, yeah, and, and got tense to, in that way that you're, you're really kind of tense <clears throat> with Tony Montagna. Yeah. It's, it's very tense. It's moving. Good way to describe it. Um, and, and I just, again, I, like I said, I, I didn't expect it to be funny. I, I expected it to be grimy, uh, which I, I use as a positive term for a, okay. for a movie, especially a okay. '70s movie. Right. But it's funny. It moves fast. It doesn't it does. feel like it's two hours. It covers a lot of ground, a lot yeah. of years. Yeah. In his life, yeah. and it's and it's like it's a it's a. I feel like it is a pop cultural artifact that people may not want to watch it now, but it will survive. As as something that is about Trump. And is about this moment in that we find ourselves in. It's a, it's yeah, in that way, it's a unique product. Uh, folks might not want to watch it before election day. <laughs> they might not want to watch it after election day, given you know some of the narratives and polls. And but we really don't know at this point, uh, of course. But you know, I think it will live as as a snapshot into his early life. I think you know when looking back, how how I covered uh, Trump when he came into office was I tried to do a character study of his his business life. And going back and trying to match up Google Docs and research I did um, after I watched it the second time, it looks like I pick up my research 
in late 2016, early 2017, about the time the movie lets the movie stops. Right. And then I picked it up from there trying to get this. Who is this guy who I knew my adult life from movie cameos and McDonald's commercials and um, you know, he's on, you know, I'm eight years old and passing through the living room and my mom's watching Donahue and there's this Donald Trump guy. Right. Um, so I knew the uptime. board game, right? The board game. And then part of the deal right? in Doonesbury. <laughs> I don't remember watching more than five minutes of the apprentice at a time and, right. and not very many drop ins during that time of his career, but it really does show how he got to that person that, that I started researching in, in, in 16 and 17. And I thought it really showed how he went from this kind of naive, but very ambitious guy who knew where he wanted to go. I mean, the Commodore hotels in one of the first scenes where he's, he wants to renovate that and turn it into, you know, a, a New York, um, really iconic, um, landmark, yeah. landmark. Yeah, yeah. Landmark. But he didn't really know how to do it. And, and Roy is the one who it's like his ambition and this doggedness, this um, intensity mm -hmm. finally matched up. But the intensity was really unlocked by Roy. Yeah. Roy is the one that unlocked him, showed him how to be the Donald Trump that we see today. And so for me, that was that was a, a, a missing piece of my own puzzle, having covered and studied this guy for so long. And again, I thought his dad uh, had a bigger role in that. But at least according to the movie... Um, his dad got him so far and definitely the ambition, you know, he, that, I think that's a gene that he got from his dad. I mean, his brother was an airline pilot, even with his troubles that takes a lot of doing and study and, and hard work to get to that point. So the ambition was, is in the genes. Um, and it just took Roy to unlock it and kind of show him these chess moves, checkers moves, depending mm -hmm. on your perspective, I guess. Yeah. Some of these, um, unsavory maneuvers business wise and legal wise. And to this day, Trump is still using the Roy Cohn playbook. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, I watched his event yesterday, this uh, Latino voter roundtable. I'm using quote fingers if you're not watching on YouTube because he didn't talk a lot about Latino voters, but he, 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 he just said extreme things. He, um, he, 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 you know, Cohen was, Cohen was always like, you know, um, always sell yourself as, as the best at everything, never admit defeat. Right. And so Trump was sitting there yesterday, bending this, revising this part of history, pumping up his own record. And I just kept thinking, well, if Roy's looking down or up from your perspective, <laughs> he's probably pretty proud of Donnie right now. And, and Trump has, I think, turned that part of himself up a little bit the last few weeks. And if there is a shift toward Trump, I think that's part of the reason why. And for some reason, this does work for the guy. It didn't work in 2020. Of course, he made a lot of mistakes with COVID. Um, we'll see if it works this time. But I, I think that Roy part that's in there has been has been turned turned up a lot. And also, fair to say, too, that this story is kind of a tragedy, too, because the way that their relationship ends. I mean, Roy, mm -hmm. Roy Cohn yeah. went on to die of AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, complications from AIDS. Um, and you know, this led to Trump, you know, by all accounts sort of shunning him. Um, but there is a, there is a moment like towards the very end that like shows their, just how far their relationship has gone and how much has shifted in, in Trump's favor. And, the, and there's a few things that are just, I don't want to give them away, but they're very, they're kind of heartbreaking. And you're, and then, and then you catch yourself saying like, these are two people who are not typically sympathetic in, in mm -hmm. real life or as, as fictional characters, you know, and, and, uh, and I think that that, again, you know, the, the conceit of like, is this a good movie? Is this a, is this good art? Art makes you feel uncomfortable. And I think that if anybody's feeling sympathy for Roy Cohn at a certain point, mm -hmm. that means that um, most likely it's the art. It's not Roy Cohn right. <laughs> that made you feel sympathetic for him. <laughs> right. I felt, a similar way for young Donald when his brother comes to him and his brother is clearly strung out and, right. and is asking for help, is right. asking for Donald's help. And Trump kind of turns him away, but says he'll help him and you know, closes the door. And Ivana, his first wife, comes down and and Donald's clearly upset and he's frustrated. He wants to help his brother. He doesn't maybe know if he should. 
and you know, a rare human moment for Donald Trump there. I felt the same way uh, after that scene. Uh, well, again, I, I, it's a, I, I feel like I'm endorsing the movie. I don't want to tell people you should go out and see it, but I do think that, uh, as, as far as like movies go, this is one of the better I've seen in, yeah. in, in a while. Um, and particularly for, you know, political purposes, just people who want to know about this stuff. Cool. And also if you just want to kind of see a scary movie, there are elements there. Mm-hmm. There do feel like there are elements of horror in there. So something for the, Could the, be. the Halloween crew too, and scary yeah. movie months. Yeah. And, <laughs> and further down the road, you know, if you like Frost Nixon, I think you'll like this a yeah. lot because we learned about Richard M. Nixon. We learned a lot more about Nixon, I thought, in that movie than maybe some of us knew. And you do learn a lot about Donald, at least according to these guys. And they did a ton of research, legal documents, biographies. They talked to folks. So there is an element of truth here. Now, they did take some liberties, as all filmmakers do. Um, but, yeah, I think it's definitely worth seeing. Don't expect to come out you know, feeling much differently about Trump, right. I think. But it there's a lot in there that, like you said, uh, as a work of art... It's definitely worth two hours. All right. Well, thanks, John, for talking about this. I know uh, um, we've got a couple weeks, le- fewer than two weeks to go until election day. Are elections ever over? I I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we laugh but, now. Yeah, we laugh now. Uh, well, or we cry, right? Um, but uh, yeah, here, here we go. Uh, thank you again for, for listening to Political Theater. And uh, sign up for our newsletter so you can get this podcast sent to you and future podcasts sent to your email uh, address. And uh, follow us on YouTube, on rollcall.com, and all of that. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.